All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, third and final studio-wide event. This is the second uh, symposium on density. We, uh, Liz Kemal and I have worked with Larry on this and we're very, very happy to conclude with today's event. So I will not do a big introduction. I just wanted to welcome you all on behalf of the 307 uh, faculty, the third year studio, and thank you so much for hanging around. Thank you, Tarek, and thanks Liz and the Dean for all his support in helping us. Just to, uh, you know how they always show on a TV show what they showed last week, or just to remind you where the plot is. Remember last symposium we were looking at uh, density in North America. We had two people, Michael Dennis and um, Roger Sherman, Boston and LA, probably no two different cities in the United States, one arguing for a, a kind of uh, physically dense city, uh, also arguing that uh, rather startling uh, set of facts uh, about you know our economic uh, peril that we're about to face in the next couple decades uh, as, as an argument for uh, increased density. I think Roger Sherman also talked about uh, a very interesting idea that there's other kinds of densities. There's uh, programmatic densities, there's social densities, and that he was working in an arena where uh, property and, uh, as how we say, John Locke's principles of uh, motiva being motivated by sort of capitalist uh, uh, influences would allow you to maximize the, uh, the, the property that you have in, in other kinds of ways rather than just physical ways, uh, which created a very interesting kind of uh, dynamic, a kind of interesting tension. Today we're looking uh, we're, sh we're shifting views to Asia. Asia is, as you know, an amazingly fast-growing uh, arena in architecture, in urbanism, in intellectual ideas, uh, certainly economically as well. And we have two uh, really good um, speakers, Bing Bu and Fei Wang, both are affiliated with the schools. I won't give a long introduction of their con uh, position in this kind of discussion. I'm going to give this uh, over to Michael, who will uh, now, I think, explain and introduce <laughs> today's session and talk about how you would like to run it. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you, me. Mike. You guys can clap. <laughs> Hi. Clapping is always good. Um, thank you all for coming. We, uh, as Larry said, we have uh, we have two two speakers, uh, both of whom teach with us. Uh, Fei Wang obviously teaches, has been teaching a variety of things, including uh, in the MS program. Um, I think last year he taught a uh, comprehensive studio, among other things. Uh, Bing Bu is uh, also teaching our Three Cities Asia program. <laughs> last year we did uh, Yokohama, Taipei, and Shanghai. Um, and actually, after this, it's not enough that we have him for two hours here. After this, for two more hours, he will present the Three City Summer Program um, in the same room. So we have four hours of programming in here today. Um, but I'll just I'll give a just a, a, a quick overview of them, their work, very short, and then uh, we'll let them speak. Um, uh, Fei Wang is a graduate of uh, Tongji University, a professional degree in architecture. And he also did a master's degree at Virginia Tech, a post-professional uh, post degree, and then uh, a history theory degree at McGill University. You can keep going. Oh, I thought you were going to tell me I no. was wrong. No. Okay, <laughs> thought I was worried about that. Uh, uh, Bing Bu did uh, also a professional degree at Tongji as well. Tsinghua. Tsinghua. Oh, sorry. It's a huge mistake. Uh, not Tongji, uh, Tsinghua, uh, sorry, big, big mistake. Um, uh, and he did a master's degree at Yale. I do, re I do recall that. Um, uh, Fei is going gonna, is gonna to start, and he's going to talk. Uh, this, the studio uh, he's doing this semester is devoted to a, 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 um, a small area in Shenzhen called Pingdi. And he's not going to talk about that, but he's going to talk about uh, Shenzhen uh, some, but also about some responses to 
uh, hyper density and hyper development in China. Um, and he's, I think Faye is also going to give us a little overview of, uh, of urbanization in China, really probably for the last 50, 60 years, just beginning obviously in 48 and looking at the gigantic and mass sort of migration to cities, um, uh, all of the big cities you know, but also I think he's going to talk a little bit about, about urban villages um, in Shenzhen, which are, if you don't know about them, they are remarkable um, urban conditions. They are conditions, and he'll explain this in greater detail, uh, uh, and you will hear many people say this, but Shenzhen, uh, maybe only 35 or so years ago, was a city, it was a fishing village, really, wasn't very big, maybe 30,000 people. Um, that's in, in 1980, Deng Xiaoping instituted a lot of economic reforms in China, and uh, Shenzhen was among, was the very first of the special economic zones. And since 1980 and 30,000 people, Shenzhen now has about 12, 13, 14 million people. So a lot of people. Um, not only that, they're all new, obviously. So you have a city with 12 million people in it, almost all of whom are new. And then it sits right by Hong Kong, um, uh, uh, which is another, you know, obviously very, very, very large uh, metropolitan area. So basically going to talk about a little bit about the history of urbanization in China, um, uh, urban villages, and then some other very unusual reactions to hyperdensification in China, which is the a kind of reaction where many, many, or some people are moving to back to villages uh, and to uh, some, some of these really interesting um, um, artist uh, villages. And so we'll, he's going to talk a little bit about that. Um, Bing has a practice, uh, as is mentioned here, one design in Shanghai. Um, uh, Bing is going to present four projects that he's developed, uh, some of which are in Shanghai, but they're, I think, all over, maybe Beijing, Shanghai, uh, and even Shenzhen, I'm not sure. Um, so uh, they will each present about 20, 25 minutes, uh, and then we will have an orchestrated conversation with them. Um, they will be able to speak without me moderating, but we'll, we'll do that. And then we'll let you all uh, ask questions. So I will start by introducing Fei Wang, and he can, uh, he can start us off. Okay, Fei Wang. Okay, uh, yeah, you can hear me, I can hear myself. Uh, uh, Larry and Michael gave, gave us the, the, the assignment to talk about densities in China, and, and they want me to talk about low density and, and us uh, being to talk about high density, and actually both of us will cover both high density and low density. For me, the argument is really, uh, density is really relative. It's nothing absolute. So, um, urbanization. So, this is a, a, a world population change. Actually, it's a, uh, the color represents uh, the percentage. So, all the red ones, they represent uh, over 50% of all the urban population of that country. And this is Australia, that's, that's China, that's the US. And then this is the six years ago. So you see that China is 32%. Actually, in 2010, we got a threshold. Chinese population just passed uh, the 50% threshold. Also, at the same year, uh, the world population also, uh, war, uh, urban population also reached 50%, which means 50 people live in the, the cities. So this is a, a, a urbanization, also the population change during the, uh, since New China, the People's Republic of China, PRC, was founded. So the change is really dramatic. And um, so this is the research we did uh, 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 last year on the uh, urbanization uh, uh, and uh, uh, urban population change in China. And it changed dramatically. And also the, the, the rural population dropped. So because uh, uh, what's going on, because we have so many people, we have the largest population in, in China. Of course, the whole Asia, we have even more. 
And when we have people overpopulate cities, and we have those problems. And so uh, the cities, they are growing. So the, 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 um, what's happening is you have to take up all the rural land. And a lot of buildings, they will tear down. A lot of farmlands, they will transform. And I'm not going to talk about that in details. So I want to go show you just a, a random kind of rural area in China during the past few years. And 14 years, this is 2002, it's still rural, kind of going to be urban, changing, but still kind of rural, half rural, half urban. And still half urban, half rural, and almost uh, urbanized. So, um, so the funny thing is a lot of uh, um, uh, um, villages, this is called the number one village in the world, in, in Huaxi village, in, 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 in Jiangsu province close to Shanghai. And they want to build their village like city. And of course they, they build all kinds of war kind of landmarks. So this is another extreme example. This is also the richest village in, in, in China. Um, it was founded in 19, 92 to transform the, the ownership into private ownership and they can, they can have their own kind of uh, uh, factories and, 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 and other migrant workers, they become the, the, the migrant, kind of the new villagers only can live outside the Great Wall. And they have their own forbidden city. They have a, a Sydney Opera House and, 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 and it's, it's, it's uh, uh, Capitol Hill of the US. And they are building many uh, skyscrapers. They also try to build the, 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 to copy the tower in Dubai, but they failed, only built a third of that. And so that's how they imagine their rural life can be urban. Just like a townhouse, it doesn't like the rural at all from our original sense. Actually, the, the definition between rural and, and urban is really shifting and changing in, in China. So even all the rural land, that's the rural land, that's also one of the most famous, most uh, dramatic images. This is still rural land, they build an Eiffel Tower outside Hangzhou. They are, they're, they're building all kind of French style new city to attract more urban people to live there, but still it's rural. Of course, a lot of factories, a lot of pollution, emptiness, because a lot of younger kind of uh, adults, they went out to work and, and the, they just leave their uh, kids and their parents and in the rural area. Sometimes they go back every five to 10 years. Even their kids, they cannot recognize their parents. And so, um, and this is uh, uh, by, by rural urban framework and then the, uh, the, the two architects in, in Hong Kong, they give a kind of a five different typologies of uh, 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 villages. So one is called the urban village and factory village, a suburban village and context village and a rural village. And they did a lot of uh, research and also practice in those areas, trying to make people aware you don't just do things in the urban because in the urban side and we don't have too many lines to, to do practice. Um, and then this is another kind of uh, uh, researcher, Jiang Jun, the founder of Urban China. He did also the the rural typology of China, he gave uh, 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 nine different uh, types and how the ownerships, they are different from the rural. Because it's not just urban and rural, for the rural it's very complicated for the ownership. The, the urban land is owned by the state, the central government, and the rural land is owned by the collective villagers. It doesn't own by individual person. That's how uh, Chinese ownership works. So I'm, I'm not going to uh, talk about all this uh, very complicated and kind of uh, uh, different models. Um, so right now, the, 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 the problem is uh, a lot of uh, kind of white collar people uh, uh, and they, they are aware of the problems in, in the cities. So they want to move back to the countryside, starting with a lot of artists. And, and also a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, immigrant workers from the rural side they, 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 they've been working in, in, the, in the city for many years, so finally they want to move back to the uh, countryside 
but it's not their original village anymore. So it's kind of a very kind of contradictory and back and forth uh, 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 relationship between rural and urban. So just give you one quick, quick example of Bishan village. Bishan village is right there, and it's, it's next to the Yellow Mountain. So that's all the Yellow Mountain area with many kind of uh, uh, world heritage sites there. And so this is the Bishan village. Um, not so many, maybe uh, one to 200 villagers there, but a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, buildings are, are empty. Then a group of artists, and, 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 and they, they move there. Um, so they find their, 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 their kind of group is called Bishan Commune. They try to set up the new kind of commune for, for, for Chinese model, but they are getting all the funding from Europe. They got millions of uh, euros to, to, to support their art project. Actually, literally, they are doing, they don't have to do anything, they just live there. That's, uh, that's their project. And so they try to preserve everything there. And if villagers said, you have that much money, you should give us Build, 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 build a lighting system, infrastructure. He said, no, our city people, we come here, we just want to see the stars. We don't want any light. We don't want to change anything. So there's a lot of conflicts between them. So they renovate some of the uh, ancestral halls into their kind of art kind of performance center. So they even kind of share with them. They, they, they publish and uh, owning and, and he published his uh, sketchbook on, 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 on Moloskin kind of super expensive luxury kind of notebook and also in Europe. Uh, so he talked about all kinds of really ideals. So that's the designer logo. And also uh, his friend, also the, the owner of the Bishan kind of bookstore, is, is, is actually it's, 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 uh, it's from Nanjing. It's called Vanguard Bookstore. And it's the most expensive bookstore in China. A lot of people, they just go to the countryside, just go to the bookstore to buy books thousands of dollars books, then they will leave. They don't really care about the village, they only care about the books because a lot of really rare books there. And uh, yeah, we talk about, oh. So the funny thing is that uh, many people are interested there, they are foreigners. And uh, so they, they try to get more attention about a lot of uh, uh, Chinese people to, 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 to understand what's, what's going on. And even the villagers, they have to uh, get villagers to come to the bookstore to gather around, this is kind of the public space, let's do something together, and they don't come. Then they have to force them, oh, you, you can come, I can give you a pen, give you a notebook as a gift, and what shall we do there? We will recite poetry there for villagers. And, and then the villagers, they, 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 they didn't want to go there, they just want to go to someone's home, they have a big living room, they have their own books, that's more public and private space, really different sense from our urban, urban kind of condition. So they have a lot of kind of symposium, a lot of discussions, mostly in English. So they publish, they, they even, so they start the Bishan Harvestable and to revive those kind of, uh, kind of ru uh, rural rituals and kind of international uh, photography f festival and trying to uh, uh, revive those kind of uh, 100 kind of craftsmanship. And even trying to make their own currency, their own money. If you come to our event, you, you, will, you will get a money exchange for uh, a quarter hour, half an hour to meet, the, to meet the artist, to meet the famous people. You can use the currency to exchange hours rather than product. And then, Actually, the, the, the Duanjing, it's also published uh, long before they founded the, 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 the Bishan village, they kind of they live there. He published uh, a, a serious kind of publications on Bishan, about literature, about a lot of uh, political issues. They even designed their own clothes, but nothing happened. And of course, in that area, it's, it's a very nice area. Even Amman is trying to build uh, uh, their new resort there. And so this is the ancestor hall in 2008, before they move in, about 2010. So they, they, they renovated the, the, the big kind of a building. Uh, it was private, they tried to make it public. Then they made a big festival, and someone died there during the festival. They expect just uh, uh, two to 3,000 people to show up for the event. Actually, finally, 5,000 people was overly crowded by 
I mean, in, in the village, and, and some people just crash and just uh, drop, I mean, uh, uh, fall from some, some steps and died. So it, it was immediately shut down after two days, and then it became like this again. So it's, it's like a, um, an our urban people's kind of a nostalgia, kind of really kind of revival back to the countryside. A lot of famous architects are doing that right now because not that much, not that many projects to build in the, 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 the urban areas, so they just move to the countryside. So there's a huge movement right now in the past two years in China. And so Shenzhen is, is kind of reversed. So I hope they works. Oops. I'm sorry, it's supposed to be a video. But anyway, so this shows uh, Shenzhen is right here next to Hong Kong. And it's a video about the urbanization, but I have other images too. So this is Shenzhen, Hong Kong. So actually the central area of Shenzhen right now um, is ranked the, the, uh, the fifth, the highest, the densest cities in, in the world. And so it's, it's highly dense, more, uh, denser than, than in Hong Kong. And you see other cities around it. So you have a similar density, but in Shenzhen it's a more ex extreme condition. So this is a kind of a population change. Actually, Shenzhen, the city, was founded uh, 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 after Cultural Revolution about 1979, 1980. And it, it was only, uh, the population was only 30,000. I mean, all the villagers there. Right now, it's about, I mean, recorded, I mean, official data is about uh, 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 15 million, but it's mystery. It could be 23 million, 25 million, because so many Im Ill illegal or undocumented immigrant workers there, and then we'll talk about it later. So that's 30 years ago in Shenzhen. Uh, but it, it wasn't called Shenzhen in the beginning. And so that's right now, it's still a couple years ago. So right now it's different, the landscape is changing. Even a couple of days ago, Michael Pong came here to talk about the uh, tallest building in China right now. And Shenzhen, they are building another one. Once it's finished, it will surpass that one to be the tallest in China. So I will give you those kind of uh, really quick run through about the, the, the urbanization. So this is the 1960s. It's like a lot of uh, fish villages, actually not exactly. There are so many hundreds of thousands of uh, 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 Hakka villages also in the, in the inner land because the migrants five to six times from central China uh, during the past 1,000 years. So that's the beginning. And this was in 1980 when Shenzhen was founded. Then it's changing, state construction going on. It's 2000, it's 2005. And it's a project Shenzhen will be like this. So if you don't have any sense about the scale yet, I will give you the comparison with other cities, including uh, Basilia and uh, Chandiga and Las Vegas. They are all emerging new cities. So that's in 1955, of course, Las Vegas was founded already. Do you know Shenzhen? No Shenzhen, yeah. <laughs> Shenzhen's there. Then 10 years, it's like that compared to other cities. See the scale, then 2000, 2010. So, so one very important, very, very, it's kind of extreme conditions is urban village. Or in, in, in Chinese, we call village in the city. Actually, it's kind of a duality of these two. They happen at the same time. Doesn't happen in many other cities in that kind of massive scale. So this is the urban village here. And you can see uh, urban is surrounding the urban village. All the urban villages, that let, they are like enclaves. Super highly dense, but it's relatively lower density than others. So that's the comparison of the two. So the condition is kind of really, uh, living condition is not great, most of them. And we, we, we call the, the, the urban villages like, uh, I mean, those buildings. Normally they are between six to eight story tall. So I'll tell you the reason just to 
uh, in one minute. So we, we, we call, or they are called like shake hand building because there is no public space uh, and all the alleyways are very narrow and you can shake hands with your neighbor and each floor is super tiny. There can be um, eight to 10 families that live in one floor. Uh, so infrastructure is really bad. The living condition is really crowded, but they have people. They have all the best restaurants in, in Shenzhen all the most authentic Hakka food. And also, don't just think about all the poor immigrants. They live there. A lot of white collar people, they live there because they are in the heart of the city. You walk out just one minute, that's the subway station, or you walk minutes to your office. So you, you can see it's really amazing kind of a phenomenon. Every morning you can see all kinds of people dressed very differently, all different classes, they come out of this village. So this is just the downtown area. I will talk about more. Uh, so w um, see how many buildings they were built and uh, how many square uh, meters, square footages they have. At least six million. I, I, I don't believe the number could be many more. So this is how urban village was formed. So those are the actual villages farmland. In China, all the farmlands, they were claimed by the central government after uh, 1949 from all the landlords and gave to all the kind of poor farmers. They are almost evenly to each one of them. And then when the, the city, I mean, uh, uh, Shenzhen was formed and many other cities as well. So and in, in 1980s, and they start to, to uh, buildings and then and all uh, villages they were surrounded and then surrounded more some of the buildings they were transformed into kind of high rise and then they see the opportunity also the the, 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 the land price is getting higher and then almost it can happen in one night all those kind of uh, original kind of uh, 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 village buildings they can reach into six to eight floors in one night. Because government, they are claiming those lands by floor area. So if you, have, if you just have that size, one story, the government will compensate that floor area according to the area you have of the building. If you have six stories, and also all the farmlands, they are even. That's why all those kind of uh, uh, urban village buildings, they are all exactly the same. There's no public space. They just maximize the use of land and horizontally and vertically. So that's what happened, something like that. So they might face of the, 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 the future is uh, they can be all tear down or by developers or by government and much higher dense kind of uh, uh, urban kind of conditions, but fewer people will live there but the labor condition were better, but the price was much more expensive. But some of the villagers here, but all the people live there, they are not original villagers. The original villagers, they are the landlord. They rent those out. And if the government or developer, they claim those buildings, and those original villagers, not people that live there, original owners of the village, they became billionaire in one night. The government, they have to compensate all the where they have, according to location, according to the size. So, um, so that's the beginning. They tear down everything very quickly. Later on, the, the villagers they build as high as possible, so it's getting more expensive. The government they don't they don't want to touch them. So that's why there are so many enclaves in Shenzhen. So that's the most extreme condition of the urban and rural. They clash together, and so in one city there are two systems superimposed on top of each other. So those are the urban kind of uh, urban nice areas because in Shenzhen uh, there are so many nice landscape and mountains. So those are the urban nice areas with buildings and infrastructures. Those are the urban villages. They are almost everywhere. So the urban villages they face three different kind of destinies. One is tear down to build new ones. The other just the beautification 
mainly they just painted outside, not inside, for the beautification to the public or more urban space in, 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 in the city. Or they have a uh, regeneration, so that's the model I can talk about in one minute. So Dauphin Village. Dauphin Village is right there, still not far from the city center. So let me show you very quickly, because for Google Earth, we cannot see everything from the beginning, but you can tell the whole area is kind of, uh, this is in, you can see the date there, 1979. It's still kind of rural and a little bit urbanized more. So that's the first clear image I can get. It says 2002. So it's already became an enclave by the infrastructure, by all other development but it's still changing in, the, in areas, in the, in the context. See more construction going on, there's still some other urban villages there, there. So this is 2006, still changing, but this area doesn't change that much in terms of the density. Why? Something happened to the village. See, it's kind of beautification. See, how many people are living here right now? About 10,000 people that live in the, this area. And 90% of them, they have the same profession. They are all painters. They are not artists, they are painters. And some of the Old buildings, I'm not sure they are really old. So that's the density you can see a little bit. And that's the life in those kind of spaces. It's still kind of highly crowded. And a lot of shops and a lot of uh, uh, studios. I will have a number later. And also they have a museum. That's the largest museum which belongs to a village in China. It's a village museum, but it's in the cities, but it belongs to a village. So before, it's something like this. So only 300 people that live there right now, 10,000. See their uh, income is about $25 at that moment in 1980 per year, per person. So it starts to change. Of course, they have a lot of kind of uh, 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 issues, social issues there. And, and then one guy came here, uh, uh, changed the whole kind of territory here. His, uh, his name is uh, uh, Huang Jiang, and he's from Hong Kong. He started to uh, uh, make the painting business there. And a lot of people, they started moving, and he, and, and also the, there's a, the, the kind of painting training course there. And so that area became the hotspot for, for paintings. What kind of paintings? So they start to make mm, streamline. And like traditional Chinese painters in Qing Dynasty, Ming Dynasty for large format of painting, one person will be in charge of landscape, one person will be in charge of persons, one person will be in charge of buildings, or, interiors, so it's like streamline, uh, but most of the paintings here, they are oil paintings. So they produce 10,000 paintings per day in that area. So one person will paint the background, another person will paint the kind of rough person, another person will draw the details. And so a lot of Mona Lisa, a lot of Van Gogh, and, and you can see all those paintings, they are exactly the same. They had a training how to paint already something famous. So uh, uh, in 2000, the, the government changed everything. The government just participated in the whole area, uh, gave a lot of support, and yeah, I can, I can explain that. So they, they, they support the oil uh, painting trading business also. They, they, they set up the oil painting street, and they changed the infrastructure, and they tear down some really bad buildings, and. Also, they give all the painters the chance to study abroad. 
to get a training in Europe about oil painting. They come back, they can be better than, 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 than also we give them a lot of uh, tax free for all those painting industry. And then they, they build a museum in 2004, 2007. And also they set up the kind of a cultural fair. And so in, in 2000, start renovation. Also in that place, there were, I think there were two schools, one kindergarten, one, one, one uh, 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 elementary school. And so they start to take care of uh, people living there, but most of them, they, they are all painters there. And also they support artists to travel to, to, to Europe to appreciate the real painting. Finally, they can see the real painting. And also in 2004, they start the first cultural fair to make a more kind of a, 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 a city level events rather than they are doing their own industry. And it became the tourist site right now. You can, you can see the, the painters, they paint. You can send them a picture of you and your lover or husband and wife, and they can, they, can, they can make that small picture into a really realistic oil painting. They can ship to you just three days. Charge very cheap, just maybe $100, or even cheaper, very, very good. And so I will give you the data later. So then that, that in 2007, Abanas, the, the very famous uh, the, the, the Shenzhen office, they built this. That's the largest uh, uh, village museum. Also, they try to have a dialogue with the original urban fabric on the facade, also on the, on the plan. But also you can see that's, that's, that's urban, then rural, then urban. So that's uh, how the oil industry, they changed. Even they build their own, own hotel, theater, and other things. And you can spend your whole day there, although it's very small. You can, uh, yeah, you, you will find something. Last time I brought students there, even including our team, and everyone bought a lot of souvenirs back. They were all amazed. So that, that's more detailed, kind of, this kind of uh, 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 streamline. It became a big industry. So this is one of the small models to compare to many other urban villages. So in, so almost every few years, they still upgrade their industry, not just one single thing. Also, once there was a, once there was a painter, definitely there was a carpenter to do the frames and to do the shipping to do many other kind of uh, chain industries all relate to each other. See, there are uh, oil painting, like called shops or studios, sometimes on the narrow street, they just paint here. They just roll the, 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 the door down. That's their studio, that size, that long. Their studio is their shop. So Chinese painting, calligraphy kind of shops are 60, and painting related 90, and art crafts are 60, so that's the uh, oil painting is their main industry. I do have a chart here. So that's the revenue. In, that, that's already transferred to the uh, uh, American dollars. So 2003, so it's uh, 12 million US dollars. So until 2007, just four years later, it's, it's kind of five times more than the original. And right now, it, it just in 2008, I don't have the latest data yet. So totally 33% of all the oil paintings produced in the war, produced there, just in that village. So they have 500 painters and, and 800 studio shops. And then they built this. And it became the public space of kind of really urban, but it's still rural. So they create a new kind of a, a urban slash rural this kind of public space. People love there. And they can have a training course there. So actually, it's not training, but sometimes they do the training in the, in the plaza. And actually, painting every single pixel of Mona Lisa, of each person only paint one pixel, something like that. That's the ending. So they were displayed in the uh, Shanghai Expo 2010. They have one pavilion just dedicated to Afghan village, designed and curated by, by, by Urbanus. So each one one artist, they will draw one pixel. They have to be perfectly matched every, everything else. So that's their ability. They still have the training course. 
So it's been exhibited everywhere. Also, they got a lot of publication, a lot of attention. So right now, the government, they cannot tear it down because they, they bring a lot, a lot of things rather than the urban village itself. So this is just the one single model of the density can remain the same or doesn't change that much, but also it's still in a, in a more kind of positive way relatively uh, because government and all other industries and all different kind of levels and the social kind of interaction all happen there. So this is just the one small example about the, the, the high density and low density kind of issues. So, um, so a lot of people, they're trying to learn this, but it cannot be copied. If you exactly copy this model, it won't survive in another place. And so this is my question, really. It's high density or low density is really relative. Thank you. No. Today I'm going to talk about. Uh, Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, the presentation is called as a design density. I'm going to talk about density, urban density. to give a big picture, which is a clutch of all kinds of these um, urban visions from all the new cities, urban renewals in China, in, in all, all kinds of cities from north to south. Uh, it's, uh, this kind of image is a kind of uh, affecting what people think about City, their vision, their pursuit about the urban life. It seems to be the perfect future world coming soon to your life uh, with lots of green, with high rise. Uh, it becomes a utopian state of this is your future. So this is not reality. It's, it's about repeating. The image is repeating itself. It's it's, it has already replaced the original. So probably we can use the term uh, by uh, f the French philosopher, Jean Baudrillard, the simulacra to describe this. It's a super uh, hyper-reality state without the original uh, image uh, reproducing itself. Uh, and I would say these, this big picture or the background for any urban designer and architects working in such an environment is a real challenge. It's a, it's a challenge from the outside. You have, to, you have to deal with this and define yourself what's the role of a uh, architect, the role of a urban designer. So I'm trying to uh, continue with the stakeholders in China urban development. Uh, from, from top down, we have the city government, uh, usually, they are concerned, they are tasked about developing new city area, new towns, new satellite towns, developing zones, and their objective is always city image, city competitiveness. And then following that, this is called construction headquarter. It's a very Chinese term. It's usually associated with uh, city government. It's an entity, it's a company, it's doing the key projects, landmarks, including these uh, cultural uh, venues, museums, opera houses, uh, government buildings, and also the sometime associated with these land developing 
projects, infrastructures. So their objective is more about speed, efficiency, and value. Then following that, we have the land developer. In China, land developers sometime, uh, it could be the government or private. Uh, usually, usually government is very closely associated with the previous construction headquarter. So they are doing the new districts, the new industrial zones. Their objective is also value and efficiency. Then following the land developer, we have these uh, normal developers. They do buildings, they sell buildings. So they, uh, they take care of these commercial development, <laughs> residential development. They care about value and they also care about brands since the, all, most of these ones are uh, uh, private or, or the, these um, uh, could be a public company or private company. Uh, then after these four um, political or, or capital side, we have these professionals like city planner. City planners are working in these uh, regulatory detailed mass plan for these new towns, new zones. Uh, usually for city planners in a classic way care about ethics, uh, urban life, city, uh, about the, 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 the majority of the people. And then uh, there's urban designer, which uh, I probably think of myself as an urban designer and the projects I'm going to talk about are also urban design cases. So the task of urban design here becomes um, more about public space, about the uh, infrastructure organization. Also, very often in China, you're, you're questioned by the authorities of character, style, what does that look like? So, but that, that's also the question I, I, want, to, I, I, I want to challenge in the, in the later uh, presentation. So after the city planner and urban designer, we have architects. And sometimes we divide architects into two groups, the star architects and the commercial architects. In China, we call it that way. These star architects, they care about more about cultural buildings, landmarks, the, mo the, the public buildings, more important things. Uh, their objective is more about media awareness. You, 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 you get a nice building down, you get a nice photo shot, you are published. That's a star architect's concern. And we have uh, the majority commercial architects following that, who's taking care of the majority of development projects, like the, the residential compounds, the commercial complex. For them, it's more important to be efficient, uh, being liked by the general public to make a better business. So in the, in the last, we have the general public. They're, they're the real consumers of these urban space and as well as these urban images. So what's their objective? Is that personal preference? Are these things affecting the uh, government, affecting these developer? I think these are more connected in certain ways um, but uh, not necessary. Like, um, I, I mean, it's, it's more intertwined. Like the images I presented, nobody is, is capable from this overwhelming uh, illustrated world of the, this perfect Eurofic future of these perfect cities. So for... Uh, for urban designers, uh, we have to understand the real situation, try to break through this um, simulacra, try to define the reality, to, to understand the reality, to define your uh, professional career in, in such an environment. So going back to the density issue, I think in, in China, there is this mutually agreed high density by authority and the capital both. Um, and on, on the authority side, they have this um, motivation about save the precious land resource. China doesn't have much buildable area. We have to save the land. As we are growing very fast, you have to 
build more on certain areas. So since year 2012, there's a new law uh, requires every new residential land should have minimum FAR of 1.0. And on the other side, for the capital side, they're happy about this uh, law and they can build more and sell more and eventually earn more. So it becomes a question for the capital side, how do you sell the high density? And it also becomes a objective for architects since your clients want to build more and you are asked to help them to sell these high density thing. That's also the reality side. So when we talk about density, we also sometimes concern about all these issues, efficiency, diversity, sustainability, or is there a instant city formula, which because this quality, uh, this value on the high, in, the, in the high density usually happens in the history of human history, usually happens in an uh, incremental way through time, 100 years, it formulates into <laughs> very interesting, nice, high-density urban area like you have seen in Europe, in Rome, in these traditional towns. But if here now in China, like the uh, city of Shenzhen, uh, Professor Wang Fei just introduced, you have a city growing that fast in five years, how do you achieve these qualities with some instant formula? So back to the visuals, these uh, images, simulacras, we always have, I, I put question marks there, because these, these, these are not what I want you to learn about. For, for the visuals, for, for a lot of cases, architects try to illustrate a new town with formal contradiction on purpose, with an image of self-balanced, self uh, high-density development and open field. Uh, with straight main axis together with a curved green belt and with old brick buildings and new glass curtain wall and with parametrical landmarks and normal city backdrop. And with all these, e all, with all these images, it's trying to probably cheat you that, okay, this is a diversity. It replaces the real diversity saying we we know the perfect image and it's not questionable. We deliver this to you. This is the uh, diversity, diversified high density urban environment you want. And the actual diversified contents or process are concealed behind these images. So as well as, well as for sustainability, we have visuals of large scale, continuous green space or water surface, and with a lot of curved roads. I, I just like I showed in these previous images, you always see curved roads because curved roads, it gives the language say, okay, it's natural. It's not like a human grid system. It's, a, it's like a natural form. So even for a lot of open field plains, Chinese planners put a lot of random curved roads there. And also we have buildings with roof green, with trees. All these things give you the image, okay, it's green, it's sustainable. But no one actually care about the actual what's uh, quality of a sustainable city. Even the images, some images are avoided here. You don't see small scale neighborhood parks scattered because you will not see that from a distance. The image speak less than the previous one. And you don't see dense street grid, and you even don't see solar panels or windmill, which probably is more popular here in the, in the, in the image advertising about a, a green city. But in China, it's more solar panels and windmills probably gives the language more about industrialization rather than a a green world, a green city. So these are all about the problems and issues and when you uh, practice as an urban designer, you have to challenge these things. You have to think about yourself on the resistance side. You are not working with these 
uh, seems that everybody already knows the per what the perfect word is. You only need to illustrate that, draw that. So I'm going to introduce uh, five projects we did before uh, about these issues in the China. The first one is a uh, it's, it's a urban commercial development in Beijing, central city, Sunny Tun Taikuli. It's a framework for diversity. The second one is called Langfang Tech Valley. It's a high density new town. And then it's Zendai Nanjing. It's a high density urban development all in one framework. And we had a competition, Shenzhen Bay Cloud City, a, a vertical city case. And the last one, Smart Land Town, is a rural area in Shanghai. We put urban thinking at that. So the first one is San Li Tun Tai Ku Li. This project, uh, the architect is Kango Kuma, but you can tell it's not a typical Kango Kuma project. If you look at the, the other commercial projects, just cross street on the lower right side of that street. It's so deserted and nobody goes there. So this project got more successful because someone did the urban design before Kango Huma came, which is me. <laughs> 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 yeah. So it was year 2002. We went there and we started the strategy, site analysis and a strategy. It's a, it's a very typical Beijing urban block with the south side uh, towards a major street and east side towards a more uh, smaller, smaller, more live vital street on the east side and a quiet neighborhood, a residential neighborhood on the west. So we define the different ages with different characters. We try to bring, uh, put a major axis on the southeast corner and with a lot of accessing point on the east side and try to put the west side more enclosed. Then with these uh, parameters, we put a few major uh, corridors or say streets, alleys into the, into the block. And it cuts the site into this form. Uh, following that, also responding to the east side entrance, we put the green corridors and try to bring people in with a more sm smooth experience and inside of the block, we put three plazas, so people have a few points you can stay around. And, event, and then its side is further cut into this form. Uh, and the project is a high density project. It's a commercial use project of uh, approximately five stories in average. So you have to think about the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth floor, how to bring people up there. So we put a matrix of uh, outdoor terrace evenly distributed to it, and then cut the upper floors into this form, and we put outdoor stairs connections uh, to lower levels and also to the fourth level, more reduced volumes. And we also suggested a more landmark piece for the top floor, a, a serpentine pavilion serving as a cultural venue, connects everything together, but not adopted by Kengo Kuma. And that's the, uh, the project as it's built out. As you can see, uh, after the architect came in, he changed a lot of things, reduced or altered, but the, the very basic uh, required pre set requirements by the urban design are carried out through these uh, architectural projects. We have uh, one enlarged major plaza uh, connecting the, the, the main entrance to the north, uh, southeast, and a few smaller plazas scattered around. And we have the corridors coming in from east side and less corridor to the west side. And it, when it's occupied, it's different from most of these um, commercial development we see uh, like the shopping, typical shopping center development. It's not, it's not centrally organized along like a major, uh, <coughs> major concourse with anchors, uh, alleyways on sites, but rather with a more generic urban setting. You have alleyways, you, you, you have uh, second level walkways connecting around 
And I think more importantly, this kind of development allows future use of the project. You, you can see more individuals here rather than a, a, a total complete piece of one single entity. It becomes a um, platform which can change in time. And the tenants are also happy about that since there you can see uh, like the smaller, the small tower buildings like this one represents Uniqlo. You can have a, a building entity representing the brand itself instead of comparing to other shopping malls, you just put a brand on the smooth, continuous uh, hallway. It's more, it's more uh, changeable since t through time. More flexibilities. And the second project is a, is a new town we did for Langfang City. Uh, it's a one mile by, by one mile square block. It's not a block, it's an it's a area. Uh, the city of Langfang is, is in Hebei province, in the middle between Beijing and Tianjin, two major cities of northern China. So we, we compared this uh, urban context with other most populated areas in China, like the Pearl River Delta, uh, where Shenzhen is. Uh, it's very dense, like a carpet, very continuous urban development. Also, we compare it to uh, Shanghai area, uh, Yangtze River Delta. It's more a network connecting individual cities. And this is uh, Beijing, Tianjin, and Hebei area, Jingjingji area. It's more like a twin peak structure where Beijing and Tianjin, the two major cities, has most of the resource. So you can see from this diagram, the GDP in Beijing is this high. Tianjin is much lower. It's year 2000, this project's year 2007. Now Tianjin has much higher. But still, most of things happens in these two major cities. And this city, Lanfang, lie in between them. It's almost flat there. So we, we try to look at three typical cities in the three uh, major urban metropolitan area. From, from uh, Shenzhen, we picked Dongguan, which is a industrial city between, Dongguan, uh, between Shenzhen and Guangzhou. Um, if you have seen the fast growth of Shenzhen, but the real battleground is actually Dongguan, I would say that, because most of these foreign investment and the capital from Hong Kong, they invest numerous uh, factories in this city area. And that's where this Made in China tag starts. It's, it's, it's a town with factories almost filled all usable land from the, the uh, city of Guangzhou to city of Shenzhen. Every piece of land are filled with factories. And we also pick up a, a Suzhou, maybe better I use this. That's the city of Dongguan. It's, it's between Guangzhou and, and Shenzhen. And we also pick up Suzhou. It's a, it's a very famous culturally, uh, in, <clears throat> with very old history, with nice gardens, uh, it's a, it's a famous city itself. It's also sitting in the matrix uh, network of uh, Yangtze River Delta. And this is our city, Langfang, in the Beijing area. So we, we compared all these, um, all these parameters in the three cities. So the total population, Langfang is the lowest. Uh, Suzhou is a big city. Everybody in China knows Suzhou, but not so many people know about Dongguan. But apparently, you can see that the unknown city has more population than this famous city, Suzhou. And in the city GDP, Langfang is very low, Suzhou is here, and Dongguan is much higher. And the third one is we see how many college students per million population. This is Langfang, this is Suzhou, and Dongguan has almost no education facility there. And this is about the service quarter, the tertiary industry benchmark, which we found Lanfang is not that bad. 
and the, the green coverage in built area, Suzhou has the most, since it's a f the famous garden city. And this is about the tax. Longfang has this much, Dongguan has these, these, these tallest. And we have a comparison of uh, urban population uh, density per square kilometer. Suzhou is obviously the highest. Langfang is still higher than Dongguan. So we also compare the three different models of uh, urban development. Uh, the, the, the Dongguan, the, uh, the Pearl River Delta area is a carpet structure. It's, uh, it's an uh, industrial sprawl connecting to everywhere. And in Suzhou, it's a old city, it's more planned. It has very clear structure of a cross. The center city grows outwards towards other cities as it's, it's pictured in the, in the urban uh, metropolitan network. And interestingly, we found in Langfang, the most of built area actually sitting in this corner. Uh, there are two reasons. There's a railroad cut through this uh, city region. So most of these development are on this corner. And more important, this corner has the edge towards Beijing and Tianjin. So it's, it's growing very dense, actually, in, in this area. So we say this probably would be the character and a advantage for the city of Langfang, uh, learning from the model of Shenzhen. Shenzhen started as an edge city from the border of Hong Kong, because where money and goods and things are coming from. So for the city of Langfang, it has these uh, north edge to Beijing and east edge to Tianjin, and this area could, forming, could, 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 could form a, a belt new city with individual developments, each, each town serving different functions, interconnected by itself and also connected to Beijing and Tianjin. Uh, so back to this uh, one mile by one mile block, we started this urban design process. We we started with defining three main entrance points as it's connected to the outside. And uh, then we define the structure with this water loop, which is very important for such a northern city in China, which collects rainwater uh, and also the neutral water uh, reuse uh, are, are could be all built along this water loop as well as landscape features. And the third one, along that loop, we defined four parks um, on each side, which each one serving a different function in this area. And we also have uh, north-south green corridors, since that's responding to the major uh, wind direction in, in this area, which is north-south. We, we have four, uh, five green corridors. Then we have in the center a central plaza which contains these uh, landmark high-rise buildings, these most important things associated with uh, administration and commercial trade. And, and last, not least, the street grids, also very important for this area. We define a very dense street grid system. And all these six things, as I marked here, these are communication spaces, which we think is very essential for a uh, technology development. You have to give people public space to communicate. Otherwise, it's a camp. It's not a city. And this is the, the final uh, mass plan. We have a residential use all around on the edge, separated from the central area of industrial use and office business. So it, it becomes kind of a a garden city model where people work in the center and live on the peripheral. Uh, you can wake up in the morning, walk through a park, walk to your uh, working space without taking any uh, vehicles or other means of transportation. Uh, and it's, it's self-sustained, a, a, a high-density urban area. Mm. The third project is a urban um, urban complex we did for a private developer called Zendai. It's, uh, it's three urban blocks. And we tr in this project, uh, we try to 
uh, give a message about uh, what you, we also communicated this with a, with a client. Can we do this project as a everything all together or in this one project, every ideal urban uh, uh, dreams like we, we, we showed in, in the images, but how to get this image working together in a, in, a, in a physical 3D built environment. So we start from the ground level. The, the first 16 meters, we have urban fabric. Uh, we, have <coughs> we, we learn from typical European city uh, fabric density. Uh, we put also different uh, scale of, of, of urban fabric, smaller ones to the, to the riverside, the bigger ones to the major roads and uh, pedestrian streets connected with plazas uh, and different areas with uh, fabric and urban life. We, we, we copied the, the urban fabric from Qingtian D of Shanghai and Potsdam Plaza in Berlin. And then we go up uh, from the 16 meter to the 24th meter, we define an area called a uh, cultural carpet which is a area uh, with all the program of cultural facilities from library to gallery, theater, museum, cinema, performance center. And the, all these things are connected in one, one single piece. And it also extends out downwards to the ground level or upwards to the, to the podium uh, terrace level. We try to give reference to these. And on the third level, on top of that cultural carpet, we name it the next nature. Uh, we, we try to name this place as uh, equally important to the major attractions, the, 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 the nature attractions in, in the city of Nanjing. A, a, a next nature green roof. Uh, it's, it's, uh, there's the uh, urban zoning required old nature on the ground level. So we have a next nature on the rooftop and for cut and folded and also connected with these old nature on the ground level. And then eventually on the, on, the, on the top levels, we have this ideal city of these developments where all the dense, the, the actual program, the office, the residential could happen on top of them. So all this connects together becomes a, a structure of this ideal city. Um, we, 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 we use this project try to explore the possibility about everything possibly together. Um, so so the, 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 the fourth one is, a, is another competition we, we took in Shenzhen two years ago. It's called uh, Shenzhen Bay Super, Super City. It's a competition for an area with three towers taller than 300 meters. So in this project, we first question that is high-rise buildings still important for us. Uh, like Shenzhen has these new high-rise towers under construction, but nobody in Shanghai actually knows about them. Even the 400 newly built buildings, second tallest in China, it's, even for local people, these high-rise are just, okay, another development happened in the city. It's, it's of no technology or social significance affecting our daily life. So if you are building again in the center of Shenzhen a, a area with more than three towers exceeding uh, 300 meters, how we can call that vertical city? So we try to say that instead of building individual towers, maybe we can put them all together to form a vertical city, a, a tower of towers maybe that can change something, become something uh, not happened before. So we, we, we did these diagrams. Uh, a typical high rise, it connects to the city for daily life. But for a vertical city, we try to uh, distribute urban life needs to the higher levels. In, try to people, get people inhabited there, not coming to the ground level every day. So it's, it's similar if we compare to these um, urban, urban scenarios. Uh, in an urban sprawl case, you, you always go to city for, for job, for, for, for the <coughs> commercial activities. Uh, but in a, in, a, in a more interconnected city, we can have uh, railroads or vertical railroads to connect all the 
programs together, maybe that can become a vertical city. So it's these, a platform connecting all kinds of air developments all together. And as a platforms, we try to define that as a small town structure with a uh, street hierarchy, with urban atmosphere, light air, uh, vegetation, and with very mixed use city program. Uh, we have these uh, quality of urban space in, in these platforms. And it's connected by these vertical trains and a, a transportation system. And also the landscape system could fold together as a continuous surface, uh, one continuous garden, but with different landscape. That's the project. And the last one I want to talk about a rural project we did uh, last year. It's a competition in Shanghai. We have won this competition. It's for a 50 square kilometer site. It's, it's a town west of Shanghai. It's called, uh, it's called, the project's called uh, Smart Future for an Ordinary uh, Rural Community. Here are the diagrams. Uh, these four pictures shows uh, the context of the village. It's, it's used to be this kind of a water village area, and gradually one of the village grows into a historical uh, small town. And later on, after the 1980s, uh, they have uh, industrial developments to the east end where there is uh, connected to the, to the major infrastructure. And in the late 90s, they start to build high rise, uh, build the new de residential development in the middle of nowhere in between the historical old town and this industrial zone. So we did the studies on the, the region compare our town and the three, uh, the two neighboring towns, uh, the industry, the, the population, uh, water network, traffic, urban area, ecological corridor, and rural structures, uh, uh, and also the, the functional analysis on agriculture, industry, service, and commercial relevance, and also tourist interests. So we, we are asked to compare this area to other major uh, tourism areas near, uh, in, in, the, in the lake region. We, we, uh, it's, it's asked by the, 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 the competition. So we compare, we didn't pick a lake, but we actually picked a lagoon. We, we can try to compare this area to Venice. Say if there, because one of our neighbor towns is, is, a, is quite famous water town tourism attraction. So our town could be something as, as a supporting role to these, uh, to this major role of the Zhu the, the, the major tourist attraction, and where more uh, industrial could happen and a more, more agriculture, more industrial could support this region altogether as a, a tourist destination. I, I, I would go this really quick through. Um, so for the strategy, we define this as uh, composite uh, actions. We, we, we try to get the agriculture more composite, doing different things in, in time. And for the industry, try to get new population designs in to help uh, the local. And the, the hybrid of commercial mode to uh, change the manufacturing into more uh, more meaningful uh, urban activities so help these locals with uh, a, 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 a mixed use development for future and, and composite transportation, uh, composite uh, ecological wetland system, uh, future development typologies and community building and also smart city uh, possibilities. And, and for, the, for the special structure, we try to connect the old town to, to this new gateway where I just mentioned there's an entrance to the, to the highway connecting to the city of Shanghai. So we see from the history, the city uh, moves from the west, northwest to the southeast because of this infrastructure change. We try to reflect about this tension in this, in this structure. Uh, try to uh, expand or retain the industry in the eastern area and 
for the western area, more agriculture and ecological preserve. And so we have uh, three crosses connecting all these areas together and forming a new structure of development, reinforce the central uh, zone of this uh, industrial area, new, new town area, and all these things are, are interconnected and the population change. And this is, the new, this is our proposal. This belt cut west, east from the center of this industrial zone and also foreseeing the possibility of program change along the north-south axis of this industrial zone. So eventually forming a, a movement from northwest uh, Old Town area to the, to the southeast uh, gateway area. I will go through this slide. These are the old town area, the old water town. And this is the center cross, new residential with this industrial change. And the southeast gateway area with more commercial. And also we have a smart village, um, not smart city, smart village, uh, which is agriculture, uh, village retrofitting system, and industrial park retrofitting. And it's a project also collaborated with uh, many different uh, pr professions. Uh, we, we worked with architects, we worked with uh, community building specialists, we worked with a uh, branding company, uh, with smart city specialists, land ar landscape architects, and policy studies. That's it. Thank you both for the presentations. I think they were very exciting. Um, I think it's, it, unless you've been to Shenzhen, unless you kind of understand that history, it is shocking to, to realize the, the speed at which the city developed. Um, I'm just make just an observation and a question maybe to both of you. One of, La one of the premises, I think, of, of the symposium that Larry put together um, and, and some of the ideas is that um, at least in the U.S. and perhaps in Europe, the, the, um, it has been assumed that greater density brings all good things. Um, so uh, greater sustainability, uh, greater economic value, greater added value, et cetera, et cetera. And I think one of the things that Larry wanted to challenge with that um, is, to, is, to, is to suggest that there's a lot of counter research and a lot of counter examples out there that are, that are <laughs> arguing, in fact, that that's not necessarily the case. I think one of the, one of the things that emerged in the first discussion, and I think, it's ger I think it's germane and important here, is that there's a real difference between urbanity and density, um, and they don't necessarily I mean, they overlap, but they, one does not define the other. For example, uh, in the project that, uh, that the Wang showed, um, where you have the most expensive library or the most expensive bookshop in China um, in a small, small village that people really only go to to buy books and come back. I mean, that is, in a sense, urbanity, right? Because you think of, like, coffee shops and bookstores, and those are all things that people love about the city. 
except it's not in the city at all. Uh, it's not dense at all. It's, uh, it's urban, it's, and it, it evokes urbanity, but it's not about density. Um, and you could say almost the opposite about the, about the urban villages. A lot of people would say they're very dense, but they're not very urbane, or they're not very, you know. So, so uh, and, and even in the projects that, that Bing was showing, um, I mean, the, the, you showed a rural project that is super, super dense, um, super tall, um, but it's not necessarily, it's not the city. It's not, it's not, it's dense, but it's not urban. Um, and so, and I think that was probably true with some of the things that, that, that got showed last week. For example, uh, Roger Sherman showed um, a shopping mall that I've been to many, many times. I mean, I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit it. It's one of my favorite places in Los Angeles. Um, it, it's a totally fake, totally uh, dense, but not authentic place at all. Um, but it's a super fun place to go. I, I'd love to go there. Um, so, so I'm, I'm just wondering, um, it seems like in China, the whole argument about and the overlay with density and urbanity just seems to get peeled apart. Faye started with the proposition that it's not really about greater or lesser density, it's more about, it's relative, right? More and less dense, uh, but does that mean more and less urban? So just a, it's a general kind of observation to, 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 to ask the question, um, is density and urbanism as a kind of way of thinking and even as a way of practicing, are those, do they necessarily overlap or can you have rural conditions that are dense and that aren't the city and conversely can you have uh, conditions in the city um, <laughs> that are also dense but not necessarily even urban. So uh, I think that's, that's what you see with a lot of what you showed, which is super exciting. Yeah, so you can answer. Or, or I, have not. I think it works. Okay. Go first. Okay. Does that question make sense? It made sense to yeah. me. <laughs> They're not the same thing, density and, and urbanism, right? They're just yeah. not necessarily the same thing. I, I, th I think the Shenzhen case is a perfect example to answer that question. For these urban villages, if you look at this image, they're, they're way much higher density than these urban development. And it's partly the reason government stops demolish them because they cannot compensate these villagers and replace that with a new development. It, because with a new urban development as defined by codes, it has certain limit on, on density. You cannot build a urban residential project in Shanghai more than FAR3 because of these uh, sunlight exposure requirements. In Shenzhen, because it's subtropical, probably higher, five to six, but these villages could probably already be eight to 10. So you cannot, the government cannot come and demolish it and pay more than they can get with a new developer. So it becomes a, 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 a contradiction of formal and informal development <coughs> instead of urban. And the second thing I want to mention that to me, these villages in Shenzhen are actually much more urbanized to me. Uh, you know, a lot of Shenzhen residents, they go to villages for the dim sum in the morning. It has much better dim sum than any other places in the city. Because these are the locals, they know the best things there. And they have interesting lifestyle, even, even though these villages are occupied by mostly these immigrant workers, the, uh, the life condition not so good. But exactly because of that, they have very limited space in their, in, in their apartment. They use the public space a lot more dense than uh, the typical residents living in a compound with huge green and fountains. They have a lot of activities in these pl small plazas, walkways in, in the village. Can I ask a follow-up? Because that suggests in a way that, um, let's say, an urban village in Shenzhen is maybe, it may be more or less dense, but I think you're making also an argument that it's more authentically urban. Mm -hmm. 
So would, is it possible to have a condition like say in Shenzhen with super tall towers that are, that are very, very dense, but that are not authentically urban? They are. Yeah. They are not yeah. urban. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I guess that's a, that's a way to, to, to say that, the, that yeah. the idea of density itself is not necessarily the same, obviously, as, as urbanity. Uh, one, one, one thing I I, um, I think I wanted to mention I didn't mention for density depends on the measurement and uh, the interesting is uh, if you think about the density for architects we measure the density by FAR uh, but if you think about the urban village that area if you think about the population density is much higher if then they transform into the new development. Even the FAR is much higher because all the developers, they want to tear down all those kind of uh, urban village FAR between three to five. They want to build even six or seven or eight. Uh, but less people live there. As, as I mentioned, that just the, 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 the public life is different. And people have more engagement there. And so the, the, the uh, the rural and urban kind of uh, separation is really by politics. Depends on, in China we call hukou, it's household register. Depends on the land use. Is rural or urban is defined by the government. Or, so it's, it's a very different kind of uh, uh, condition uh, from, from any other country's kind of standard. So it's, it's a very complicated uh, kind of condition, but even so I try to bring up the, the I mean, Shenzhen, it's, it's better condition to talk about it, but in, 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 in Shanghai and in, 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 or in Shanghai, there are several kind of cases, it's like uh, Xin Tiandi, also the, the uh, Tianzifang. Those areas, they remain kind of really low density and urban also, but they have to have a composition of all the surroundings is super high density to compa compensate the the, 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 the the preservation of that density in those kind of areas. So it's, it's, it's always the balance um, between density. Definitely, it's, it's, there's not, I, I give you an example. It's, uh, I, I feel really uh, interesting. Every time when I explain, uh, some, someone asks me, oh, where are you from? Uh, I said, oh, okay, my hometown is it's, it's Zhengzhou. It's, 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 it's the capital city of Henan province. It's, it's a big city. I said, how do you define? My city is not that big, only 7 million people. So, but for America, it's, just, uh, it's one of the largest cities or could be compared to, to New York. So, but in China, it's small, but the province has the largest population. So when we talk about the density, it's always kind of relative to, to but in a city as well. So when you have a high density, definitely you have to have a compensation. And it, even, even in the place where I live, the, the, the government, they have to, they want to build a freeway. So they have to give a compensation back to the city, they build a, uh, uh, we call the the the, the, the uh, Yang'an Road's kind of a, a, a green park along the freeway in the center of the city. They have to build more parks to build a buffering room to to compensate. But the price is much higher. I mean, on, on the edge of all the parks. So it's it's, it's always the, 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 the kind of a balanced kind of condition between different densities from top down. Yeah. I think we should maybe open it up to to. Questions, Francisco? You have one. I couldn't ask for anything better. Yeah, there it is. Uh, I guess as, as the moderator of the previous uh, sem uh, seminar, I wish we had all four con contestants together. <laughs> uh, <coughs> on the one hand, we have Ro Roger Sherman, who has made a really solid intellectual positioning of himself by identifying the political and economic conditions which he operates, being able to insert very small inter intervention because he understands the limit of architecture at that point. Uh, as a fo and then you know, we're looking here at the ability of designing an entire country at once. You know, and what we saw in my mind is a sort of a series of manifestations of the different scales and issues that comes. And one of the things that fascinates me about China and Asia in general, and I, I've, I've done several projects in China myself, is the, <coughs> is the fact that the quantity is and the speed, the, in a way the density is more of time than space, or both, in, in a way that everything is compressed and the decisions can be made in such a, a 
a rapid form, but also that the forms of, it's not, I guess it's not comparable because the forms of density in China have generated urban, cultural, and political phenomena, but also have repositioned the role of the architect in a very different way. So for Roger Chairman, it might be to design one, uh, one small lot. I remember sitting myself in a project we were doing in Pingdu with uh, the developers on one San Vanke, who designed, built a million apartments a year. That, that's density, right? On the other hand, the secretary of the Communist Party of the, of the region, and negotiating density. So in other words, Vanke would be, would be about, uh, allowed to build 10 more floors per towers if they built a library here. Uh, so for me, it's interesting that the political and economical uh, strategies that are behind this. I don't have a, a clear question. I do have a question, but it's, uh, which goes along with this because within this, all this context of being able to design a country, for me, it's one of the most interesting things happening now in China is the Hoku regulation. Because as, as far as I understand before, the division between city and countryside, that's when you pay, you, are, you started. The people living in the rural areas could not have a foothold really or legally in the, in, in the city. And now with the Hoku regulation change, now the, the rural population will be able to move into the cities. So this sort of renegotiation of city and countryside seems to be incredibly powerful and important. And I wonder if you could comment a little bit about what impact that might have in the way you understand sort of the city today in China. I, I can give a little bit comment about uh, your previous comments uh, about the, the architect's role, architect's limits. So for, from my point of view, I feel, I feel for Chinese architects or architects in China, uh, we haven't reached our limits yet. So some architects, they are doing really fantastic job, like 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 one that mentioned Urbanus. So it's, it's very interesting because uh, they, they find their office is called Urbanus, really, really to urban issues. But most of their part is really renovation projects, and, and including all the parks and, and, and the parcels in, in, in the cities. And then something very interesting in the beginning, the only way to, to, to uh, deal with urban village just to tear them down and to build more, more higher dense kind of uh, communities. And, and then, that then so there is no any other way. So they did something, is, uh, they did research on urban village. They have many proposals, even published a book. Then they try to engage with uh, uh, the, the Dublin village, many other villages in the first place. They were so shocked that in the beginning, it's, oh, wh why, why do we want to do some projects in urban village? That's their first sense in the first few years. Then finally they find that they have the best life. They, and also they, they, shall be, they should be the cultural heritage site as well. Um, and not, 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 not just the, uh, 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 the physical buildings, also they have a culture there as well. So they, 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 they did a lot, a lot of the research. They published a book, they got a really big sensation. A lot of, a lot of designs are really rough, it's very conceptual. And then they have that documents, they talk to the government. Then they help the government to change the regulation on, on urban village, to change the, the new regulation, the policy on the density for the future of the urban village as well. So that's the, it's really architects, we can do something to, to, to change it. So another example is uh, uh, they, they were trying to, to do the, the, I think it's Bai Shizhou, that's the largest urban village existing so far in Shenzhen. They want to tear it down. Uh, who's the architect? Is there KPF, SOM? They are developing the whole site. So they've, they've been helping the, the, gum, the, the developer and the government to decide how to do that in a better way, not just to tear them down totally. And because that's in a very central area. So in, in China, for all, and he might know better, uh, for all those kind of uh, 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 development, you, you should have uh, 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 how much public, public space you should have and the green, greenery ratio, how much percentage, 30% roughly. And so um, for, for, for them, this, this, uh, the developer said, how can we balance that if we want to keep the center of the village, to preserve them, how can we deal with that? And then they want to work with the developer trying to persuade the government, uh, the policy maker, to, uh, to make sure if we want to keep those urban village in I mean, some 30% of the area, and then we can treat that area as a greenery ratio. And then they, they're almost there. 
finally, uh, the, 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 the KPS, KPF SOM, they find them. They, they, then they directly persuade the, the, the developers that you can make more money than choose our design. So they spend almost three or four years following the project, almost there, and they persuade the government, but the developers said, no, we, we don't want to do it. So right now, a group of architects and artists and uh, urban planner, they, they, they are doing another big movement just to preserve another village and also in, in Shenzhen. So that's really something that architect, architects can do or if you don't have a limit, then architects can do anything and just to fulfill the, I mean, as a, as a, as a commercial architects, as he categorize them, but most architects, maybe 90% of the architects, they are doing something like that. So for architects, we still haven't reached our limit. Well, we can do that to change, to, to, to help the, 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 the policy makers change the policy to, to, to do something really, something you can compensate. Yeah. I, I I want to add to that. I think it's, uh, it's in, in recent years, this year or next year, there will be change in the regulations of land zoning in China. Like, like Faye said, if, if you see, you see a, a zoning map in China, you see a lot of green space. But actually, if you look close, compare that to a satellite image, these green spaces are actually villages. Because villages are not recognized as a urban area in, in, a, in a zoning. But uh, I have read in our news that uh, the new uh, minister of the uh, China Land uh, Land Construction Development, she's she's trying to change these, and <coughs> have you have to recognize these the actual c condition of the existing and making planning equally for for urban and rural area. So eventually, I think probably the end is the, and also personally, I don't think there is a a line between urban and rural. These are are the same lands, maybe the difference is only only on density. It should not be like different uh, treatment or regulation for, for different areas. Questions? Some questions. Sleepy questions. <laughs> Liz has a question. Wait, wait, wait. Go ahead, just scream it. I, I, I would say that most of them are quite successful on fulfilling the image of utopian cities. So that's why this utopian image could reproduce itself like again and again. But the, 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 ch the real challenge is that as a, as a design profession, are you contributing anything to this cycle? Like, uh, like what, what design brings to the city instead of like just following existing paradigms. You know, one of the situations in China is you have uh, design institutes. So they're, they are like big, gigantic commercial offices that are, that are huge and that you, have to, that you have to participate with if you're, let's say, if you're building from, from outside. Big, I mean, OMA, anybody who's, who's building in major urban areas have to they're like local architects, but they're not. They're, I mean, they're, they're LDIs. They're like huge institutes. Um, d just to that point, I actually, I, I was on, a, I was on a, a, a jury for about four years ago for a, a prize called the Far Eastern Prize for like the best five um, buildings in Shanghai. And I, when I arrived, I, we were going to tour all the buildings. And I was so excited because I thought I was going to get to go and view all these great towers. Uh, as it turns out, um, none of the towers are built by Chinese architects. They're mostly SOM, KPF, 
RTKL, they're just, they're big, gigantic corporate firms. So when you look around the skyline of Shanghai, <coughs> they're mostly, with, with few exceptions, they're, they're mostly big corporate firms. All the projects that we saw, the top five buildings that year, were all adaptive use projects. So they were all you know, smaller firms, uh, Narian Hu, offices like that, who, who actually were doing really beautiful, very small scale work, very unlike what, what one you know, would imagine is going on in this super fast, super boom uh, kind of city. So th there, there are real kinds of um, uh, disconnects between you know, what, we, what we think of as practices, I think, and, and especially, you know, Bing, you talked about the difference between com you know, commercial offices and what you call st star architects. Uh, now Wei was here last week, and she gave a lecture. And in fact, y you know, a lot of her work was. Uh, I think I have a sense that she viewed uh, its importance really relative to the amount of magazine publications and publicity <laughs> the project got, not not so much by the, you know, by the impact it had on a community or not or whatever. So, yeah, it's a it's a. So, yeah, Roger Sherman gave us a secondary account of why he did what he did, but I think that's, uh, that's a kind of a theoretical argument for why you do what you do. I think they, at least it's been my experience that a lot of the really high-end design firms just do that because those are the constraints that you work under and that's how you make buildings. Yeah. Liz. Yeah. Um, in the, I guess in the constant context of instant cities, instant culture, instant societies and appropriation, uh, I'm just wondering about the kind of Chinese notion of history as, um, as having cultural value, you know, real kind of cultural value. I mean, the only <coughs> resistance that um, we were, you know, that, that uh, Faye showed was the Bishan village and the way in which people were operating in a very kind of local way. Um, it's just a kind of general question because you don't, you, you know, you see all these giant things, so or, or many of them readily kind of inhabited. How does history kind of, how does, how does, <laughs> how does the role of history, especially in relation to place, um, how's it understood? I, th I think I think that's a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big uh, question. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, I, I recently got uh, this project uh, last month. We, I, I, I'm commissioner with this uh, urban study project by the city government of Ningbo. They ask us to do this urban building character study. It's like a, a city asking others who I am. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what's, the, what, what's the character of me? Um, I think I think that it's it's a, it's a very very tricky project. I I, I haven't fully like, prepared for for that. I, but I'm I'm formulating ideas these days, trying to get certain areas in the city for studies, and also organize a few workshops, symposiums on this, and to get different opinions in these things. Uh, because to me, essentially, cultural character of the city, value of the city would not be defined by a single architect, by someone say, okay, look, you are this pretty city like this. You, you should have this character. But instead, it should be a collaborative uh, study with uh, locals, with people from different professions, try to form ideas all together. And it, more importantly, by uh, nowadays contemporary, Right, or the, the practitioners nowadays doing things there instead of by a, a, a textbook of uh, like, okay, that's the history. I think it's a, the history should be defined by, by nowadays, by, by the current, it's, it's, it, the history is always should be defined by now instead of looking back. I, I don't know if this answers. <laughs> <laughs> Francisco is going to last, ask the last question because... Uh, can, can I, can I... Oh, unless can we have we, another... Can yeah. we give a lot of... 
feedback just, for just, police. Just uh, make your comment in it because we have to okay. we actually have another presentation. Yeah, be, because uh, uh, right, right now I, 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 we had a lot of discussion about history, how, how to define <coughs> Chinese, and everything we're doing right now is not so Chinese. And since uh, uh, mid 19th century, China has been invaded many times, and also uh, so it's been, it's been 200 years, and we don't have that much left. And even in Beijing, the Forbidden City, all the all the urban fabric totally destroyed. And even Liang Sichuan was the first group of architects educated in the U.S. Went back to set up the first architecture school in China, and then they tried to preserve the city, then they failed. And even his own house was teared down just last year. And so, and uh, many cities, they try to find their own identity to build fake uh, historic streets. It's like a Hollywood movie, Simulacra, everywhere it's happening. So in many ways, they, uh, even they tear down some old buildings, they try to build a new old city. So it's happening. So it's really the weird sense of how to define history. And some of them, they define them through Simulacra. Some of them try to define a little bit through the real history, but still, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with also Michael uh, also talk about this really history. We are in the history. It's not just go back. I mean, past is not just history, also future. It can be future history as well. So it's really the weird sense right now. People are changing, people are debating, but it's, it's, it's still a lot of ways it's still top down and, and a lot of architects we, we do something really, really good, remarkable to push even right now the all the, the Korea houses and they, they form another big movement to, to save all the Korea houses by a lot of the foreign architects and Chinese architects as well. So just do the experiment to show this is a way, this is a possible way and we can do make it better, not just to tear down or to build something fake. So it's many ways to I mean, parallel at the same time. So. Okay, thank you, uh, Fei Wang. Thank you, Bing Bu. Thank you, guys, for coming.